everyone, and welcome to episode 155 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, this week, I thought we would take a second to talk about medieval grooming, because when I think about human beings, one of the things that is really familiar to us all, I think across cultures, across time, is the fact that we want to look our best and smell our best, put our best foot forward whenever we are interacting with other human beings. So grooming is something that is really popular in the Middle Ages, something that people really cared about in the Middle Ages. So I thought this would be a fun topic to cover today. So we'll be talking about medieval grooming right after this. Despite all the work that historians are putting out all the time, I think there is still this misconception that people in the Middle Ages enjoyed being dirty, or at least they didn't care about hygiene all that much. And I'm going to prove The opposite is true to you over the course of the next few minutes, so I'm really looking forward to that. But I think that perhaps what we are mistaking for an enjoyment of being dirty is actual hygiene poverty, and that means that it's hard for a lot of people to access things like hot water and soap and those tools that help them to have the standard of hygiene that we have decided is correct. And I think this is still a problem that happens today. There are a lot of people who live in poverty, and so hygiene products can be difficult to get hold of. So I thought this would be a good moment to give a historical shout out. One of my favorite historians, as you know, is Dan Jones. And his wife, Jo, has, in conjunction with other partners, created a charity called Beauty Banks. And Beauty Banks collects together beauty products and hygiene products and works with food banks to distribute those to people who have hygiene poverty. So this is children, this is women, this is people in shelters that just can't afford these beauty products and hygiene products themselves. So this is a great way to help them feel good about themselves so they can put their best foot forward because I think that is a very human thing that we want to look good, smell good, so we can feel good, so we can do our best work. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Jo Jones and her work. If you're living in the UK, I'm going to drop the URL for you at the end of this episode and you can help donate to beauty banks and help other people lift themselves out of hygiene poverty. So we need to recognize that it is difficult sometimes when you don't have a lot of resources and you're doing everything yourself and there's no electricity that it can be hard to access good hygiene. But people did really like to be clean. And that's something that we saw when Catherine French was here a couple weeks ago talking about when people got more money, they invested more in hygiene products. And so let's talk about this stuff. Okay, we're going to start with baths. And if you're Familiar with my work, this is something that, you know, maybe you want to skip over because this is something that I talk about quite a lot, but I find medieval bathing habits endlessly fascinating. So when people wanted to have a bath in the Middle Ages, what did they do? We know that people enjoyed having baths because bathhouses existed. We have laws and regulations about bathhouses. And we also have coroner's reports from people who actually drowned trying to get clean. So we know that people were trying to get clean. Where would you go? Well, there were bathhouses left over from the Roman Empire all over medieval Europe. So you could go to one of those established places and have your bath just like you would during the Roman Empire. The Romans built really cool bathhouses that were often fed by hot springs so you could have a nice warm bath there. These were communal activities, so you'd be having your bath with other people. It wasn't usually co-ed. There's an asterisk here. It wasn't usually co-ed, so you'd have a time of day when the men would be going and having their baths together, and a different time of day when women would be going and having their baths together. Now, it is true that more people were having more baths near the Mediterranean. I think this is true for lots of different reasons, some of them cultural, and some of them the fact that it's actually a lot warmer (laughs) in the southern parts of Europe than it is in the northern parts of Europe. So maybe you don't have to worry so much about heating your bath water. So you have those established Roman baths that people could go to for a fee. And you could also bathe at home, of course, in a big bathtub that looked like a barrel. Now, I did say that if you're going to a public bath, there was a bit of an asterisk here next to the co-ed thing. And that is that people could go to the baths for reasons that were not just about getting clean, but also about visiting a sex worker. So bathhouses often had a bad reputation because it was a place for people to get naked, sometimes have dinner. And that was, of course, a good place for a sex worker to pick up some work. This is one of the reasons why bathhouses called stews in England were placed across the Thames, kind of away from polite society, where all the playhouses were in Shakespeare's day. This is to give you some distance between people in the baths. 
That said, people did like to have their own private baths as well, so that when there were regulations in London, for example, in the 15th century, saying that's it, we're closing all the bathhouses, people said, "Wait a second, can we still have a bath at home?" And that was allowed. So we know that people enjoyed bathing, and this is something that you could do by heating up water and putting a whole bunch of water into your big. Barrel bathtub. You'd also want to put in a linen sheet so you didn't get splinters in your nether regions. When you're having a bath, this is a time when you'd be using soap. So we know that people wash their hands a lot. I'm going to get to that in a second. But people were using soap in the bath. So what kind of soap were they using? Well, when they were cleaning things like dishes and laundry, they would be using mostly lye soap. But that is very alkaline; it can sting quite a lot. So the best type of soap is olive oil soap or white soap. People talked about Castilian soap being the best kind of soap, and that olive oil soap is something you can still get today. It's pretty nice. Makes your skin feel good, and we know in the Decameron at least once Boccaccio mentions that some people have cloves in their soap. So we know that people are also making their soap smell good by adding herbs to it. Of course, you could just add things like flower petals to your bath or to your hand washing water to make sure that it smells good and that your hands smell good afterwards. So speaking of nice smelling hands, we know that people wash their hands quite a lot. For example, monks always wash their hands before they went into mass. We know from Catherine French's work that the richer you were, the more you wanted to have available water for people to wash when they got in off the street. People are washing before dinner, and that means that they have special dishes for that. So you do have basins where people are washing their hands, and special ewers called aquamanils where people are. Pouring water out, nice smelling water for you to wash your hands in, and of course that means that there are linen towels for people to use afterwards, which means that people are doing a lot of laundry too. And laundry is another podcast episode I did, so I'm not going to get into that too much now. So baths and hand washing, I think, are kind of familiar. What are the other things that people did to get themselves ready for the day in terms of grooming? Well, archaeological evidence has dug up a whole bunch of things, which I think are really interesting. The first one, of course, being combs. So we have combs going back to the Viking era, of course. And shout out to the people at Horrible Histories, including Greg Jenner, who everyone probably has already heard of, a historian who likes to get into this kind of detail. But Horrible Histories has a skit that's called Viking Eye for the Anglo-Saxon guy, and I think everyone should watch that. <laughs> Unlike what we see in the Northmen, there is a lot of value placed on looking good and smelling good, especially for the Vikings who were really interested in the shiny stuff that they could pick up when they were traveling everywhere. So combs are something that we know that Vikings used, and we also have combs that were created for the liturgy. Some of my favorite combs are ones that I've seen at the Cloisters Museum in New York, and these are liturgical combs, so they're for. Priests, and these ones are carved from ivory. So you have Viking ones that are carved from wood or bone. You sometimes have ones that are carved from ivory. And what's really cool and consistent across combs across time is often they have wider teeth for untangling, and then you have the finer teeth for getting nits out. And when you go to get a comb today, often they still have those two sides to them, right? You have wider teeth and finer teeth. And I think this is something that is really kind of cool that connects us across time. One other thing that you see from the Viking Age on, and of course this is something that is even older, is tweezers. And tweezers aren't just useful for getting splinters out. Tweezers are good for removing hair. So this brings me to hair, and this is something I think is so consistent across humanity. Our really weird and complex relationship with our hair. So if you look at medieval manuscripts and we're talking about the actual images and the writing within them. There is this obsession with making your hair look good. <laughs> so when I think about tweezers, I think about those 14th century women who are plucking their hair way back to show off their foreheads and then have their beautiful hats on top of that. But of course, you want to use tweezers to make your eyebrows look good, maybe to trim up your beard line. There's lots of reasons to use tweezers. And we know that people were not as into shaving body parts aside from the face as they are nowadays, but there was some of that going on. So we know people were shaving their faces. The beard fashion kind of came in and out of style, and so you could use a really sharp knife for that, or you could go to a barber. And this is one of the reasons why barbers were also surgeons. They had the sharpest tools. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. So 
people would be shaving their faces, but they might also be shaving other body parts. And this is really fascinating to me. One of the places where you can find a lot of information about what people valued in terms of their hygiene and their grooming is the trotula. I spoke with Monica Green about the trotula in another podcast, and we talked a lot about the actual book itself, what it means, but we didn't talk a lot about the stuff that's in it. And there's a whole section on medicine and there's a whole section on cosmetics. And in the cosmetic section, you find a lot of information on hair and some of it is about hair removal. And what's interesting to me about this is many of the different sections on advice on hair removal talk about making sure that you go to a bath or a steam bath so that you have your skin nice and warm. And this is something that we talk about today when we're talking about shaving. You want to have nice warm water to open up those pores and make it easier for yourself. But they also give you advice on other depilatories, things that you can rub on your skin to get rid of the hair. They also talk about plucking. And this is interesting because one of the sections that talks about plucking your hair talks about what we might think of today as the bikini area. And this is interesting to me because I don't come across it all that often. It's not something that is necessarily talked about in other texts, but in the trotula and the part on cosmetics, they talk about hair removal in what we might call intimate areas. And so this is an interesting thing. It's kind of fascinating to me. Often they talk about shaving hair to get rid of it or using a depilatory to rub things off. There is one mention in the trotula of wax as well. And since a lot of people use wax today, I thought I would read just this section for you from the trotula so that you can see some of the things that are really similar, although it is quite different also. So this says, Take Greek pitch and wax and dissolve them in a clay vessel. And these things having been dissolved, let a small drop of galbanum be added and let them cook for a long time, stirring with a spatula. Likewise, take mastic frankincense and gum arabic and let them be mixed with the rest. Having done this, let it be removed from the fire and when it is lukewarm, let her smear her face, but let her take care not to touch the eyebrows. Let her leave it on for an hour until it becomes cold. Then let her remove it. This refines the skin and makes the face beautiful, and it removes hairs and renders every blemish well-colored and clear. So unlike today, you don't put the wax on and then add some linen and then rip it off, although (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if people were doing that too. But this is put the wax on, let it dry, and then peel it off. And of course, it's going to take some of the hair with it, which is why you should not do it on your eyebrows. So here you have medieval women that are waxing their faces to make sure that (laughs) there's no hair on the face and also that the blemishes are gone, that it's nice and smooth. And this might be a good time to mention the ideal woman in medieval Europe, at least in romance and the images that we have, tends to be a woman who is very fair skinned. And this is pretty consistent across time, problematic as it is. The ideal woman is also blonde, which is something that we see today, right? If we look at Barbie, She is that same quote-unquote ideal woman. But the ideal woman in medieval Europe tends to be what modern magazines would call pear-shaped. So she has a small upper area, but when it comes to her hips, they're nice and broad. And she usually has a little bit of a tummy, which is something that, of course, is a sin in today's beauty markets. So... (laughs) When you look at a medieval woman, the ideal woman tends to be pear-shaped, she tends to be blonde, and she tends to be fair-skinned. So a lot of the advice that you have in cosmetic books and medical books wants you to help to get your hair lighter and to get your skin lighter, although that's not always the case. I want to come back to that in a second. When it comes to the ideal men, of course, there aren't as many descriptions of this, but I think we can look to fashion to help us kind of figure that out. So over time when tailoring becomes a little easier for people to do with things like buttons, we start to see a change in the shape of masculine fashion and it starts to accentuate the shoulders. So they start to have wider shoulders, especially near the end of the Middle Ages, and they start to have tighter leggings. So I would say, at least in the later part of the Middle Ages, it's pretty safe to say that the ideal masculine form has broad shoulders and great legs and usually a great bottom too, because some of the priests will tell you that the hose could be quite tight in the later Middle Ages and it's meant to show off the buttocks. So the ideal male form looks kind of like we would expect it to look today as well. It's pretty consistent. 
So I mentioned that the ideal woman, at least in medieval romance and some of the manuscripts that we have that reflect those romances, tends to have fair hair, but that's not necessarily essential for beauty. So if we come back to the Trotula, which is a collection that's based on texts from Salerno, so Mediterranean region, it talks about ways that you can make your hair fairer, and it talks about ways to make your hair nice and black. There isn't really an in-between. There's no like brunettes in there that are meant to be beautiful with their chestnut or auburn locks, but it does have recipes for making your hair fairer or darker. And they involve a whole bunch of different things. But again, it's over and over. It's wash, wash, wash. And also use a whole bunch of herbs to make your hair smell good. And this is interesting too, because in the Middle Ages, unless you are a very young woman, your hair is going to be covered all the time. So having nice smelling hair is something that should be at least something that you could smell through the veil, or it's meant to be something for your partner. And I think this is an interesting thing to note, that there is this idea that you should be smelling good on your hair for your partner. So why don't we take a second to talk about how to give yourself nice black hair. And this is, again, this is from On Women's Cosmetics, and you can find it in the Trotula. And in case I didn't make it clear before, this is all translated and edited by Monica Green. If indeed you wish to have thick black hair, take colocynth, and having thrown away the insides, let it be filled with oil of laurel, to which have been added henbane seed and a bit of orp mint, and let the hair be anointed with this often. If indeed you wish to have hair soft and smooth and fine, wash it often with hot water in which there is powder of natron and vetch. Of course, there is this other recipe for having long black hair, which I think might be my favorite, and that's this one. If the woman wishes to have long and black hair, take a green lizard and having removed its head and tail, cook it in common oil. Anoint the head with this oil. It makes the hair long and black. So there we go. That is how to have long, black, and beautiful hair. <laughs> you can try it out at home, or maybe not. If you do, though, report back to me because I want to know how well it works. So we talked about removing hair. That's something that humans are always interested in. But of course, humans are also interested in growing hair. And that's kind of gone out in a couple of those recipes from the Trotula. People want to make sure they are growing hair. Baldness in men and women is still something that people find difficult to handle. It's something that they want to fix. So here are some examples from Welsh medical texts. And this is the book that was translated by Diana Luft that I talked to you about on a previous episode as well. So here are a couple of remedies for baldness or to make your hair grow. To make hair grow, take a mouse and a wren and put them into a new clay pot on the fire until one can make a powder from them. And then take bay oil and boar lard and pitch and goat blood and mix them together in a skillet over the fire and make an ointment from them. If that doesn't appeal to you, <laughs> here's another one that is a little bit easier to handle. Another is, take vinegar and the same amount of rose oil and galangale and make a powder from it and put the powder with the oil and the vinegar. And firstly, rub well the place where you want to grow the hair with a linen rag and then daub it with that ointment. That sounds like a much easier recipe to do, I think. <laughs> so again, if you want to try that one out, get back to me to tell me how it works. So we've talked a lot about hair. And of course, in the section on women's cosmetics, there is stuff about cosmetics. And as I mentioned, some of these things are about whitening the skin, lightening the skin, getting rid of blemishes or getting rid of sunburn. Also, people wanted to get rid of warts and freckles, which I think is very familiar to anybody who is scanning the internet today. And of course, there's cosmetics that suggest that you should be reddening your lips too. So there is that. You do see that too. You don't see things about making your nails look better, which is something that I think is a big part of the beauty industry right now, painting your nails or grooming your nails. There is a concern in the Middle Ages about having clean nails though. And we know this because there are admonitions in manners books saying, don't clean your nails with your eating knife at the table because that's gross. <laughs> don't cut your nails at the dinner table. That's gross. So we know that people actually did care about their nails and the cleanliness of their nails. I think this is also reflected in the amount of hand washing that's happening over the course of the day. But people didn't have anything that would really color your nails. So that's not something that you see a lot in medieval books. So I mentioned that lipstick is a thing, at least in the Trotula. And that brings me to 
the mouth. This is something that we really are worried about when it comes to interacting with other people, especially if we want to attract other people. We are very concerned about our mouths, how they look, how they smell. And so this is something that you do see a lot in medieval texts too. I think there's an idea that medieval people had awful teeth. And I think that their teeth would be worse than they are today. We have pretty great oral hygiene today with the products that we have and the habits that we have and the tools that we have, as well as dentists. But medieval teeth were probably better than the teeth in the early modern period only because they had much less access to sugar. So they didn't have the same amount of sweetened stuff that was eating at their teeth. They did have things like honey. They did have sugar that was imported as well across Europe, but not as much as people had in the early modern period. And of course, not as much as we have today. So their teeth were probably not as terrible as we think, but people were concerned in making them better, of course. And of course, one of the ways to do that is by whitening them. Now, I have been interested in medieval toothpaste for probably way too long. I find it really interesting because, again, this is a very human thing, making sure that our breath smells nice, especially when we are in close proximity with people. And, of course, if we want to kiss them, right? So I think this is really interesting. Most of the medieval toothpaste recipes that I have seen have to do with creating something abrasive and scrubbing that on the teeth. But there are other ways, too. So here are two in a row from the medieval Welsh medical text book that I was mentioning a bit earlier. To make your teeth white, take branches of grapevine and burn them into charcoal and brush your teeth with that charcoal. So that's pretty conventional. Here's another one, though. For bad breath, take mint juice and rue juice and put them into your nostrils because it will strengthen the brain and get rid of the filth. So (laughs) this is about addressing the problem and not the symptoms. So if you stuff this juice up your nose, it's going to help clean things out. There's, of course, another one right after this that says, Another, take ivy juice and put it into the nostrils and pound rose in a mortar and boil it in wine or in honey and strain it through a linen cloth and put it into the nostrils. And as long as you're using this medicine, drink wormwood juice with wine. So again, making sure that the internal part of your body is nice and clean and smells nice, and that is going to make your breath smell nice also. I have to say, before encountering these recipes in the Welsh medical texts book, I hadn't come across anything that talked about putting things in your nostrils to take care of your bad breath. So that was really interesting to me to come across that. But of course, we know that breathing is happening through your nose and your mouth. So it makes sense to try and take care of this, both in your mouth and in your nose. Some more conventional ones you can find in the trotula. So here are ones that perhaps are more palatable than putting things in your nose. For whitening black teeth and strengthening corroded or rotted gums and for a bad-smelling mouth, this works the best. Take some each of cinnamon, clove, spikenard, mastic, frankincense, grain, wormwood, crabfoot, date pits, and olives. Grind all of these and reduce them to a powder, then rub the affected places. Likewise, in order to make black teeth white, take 10 drams of roasted pumice, 10 drams of salt, two drams each of cinnamon and cloves, and honey as needed. Mix the pumice and salt with a sufficient amount of honey and place them on a plain dish upon coals until they burn and reduce the other spices to a powder. And when there is need, rub the teeth. Now, I don't know about you, but that second one sounds really painful, using pumice to rub your teeth. And it does mention whitening your teeth if they are blackened. So this is probably to remove plaque. But oof, that just sounds quite painful. Of course, you do see a bunch of the type of things that you would put in your mouth that would make it smell good. Other recipes or advice books that tell you about what you should put in your mouth to make it smell good usually have clove. So chew on some clove before you go on your date. Another one that's mentioned in the trotula later on is parsley. Chew on some parsley and that's going to make your breath smell good. An Islamic woman is mentioned putting laurel leaves under her tongue. And this one's especially mentioned for when she is going to be going on a date, let's say. So taking care of your breath is something that's really important, whether that's scrubbing your teeth or chewing on something that is going to make them smell a lot better. Medieval toothpaste recipes are definitely something that I wouldn't recommend picking up, though, because scrubbing your teeth with pumice is probably something that your modern dentist is going to say definitely don't do. 
So these are just some of the ways in which people wanted to make themselves look good and smell good for other people. And I think it's really interesting, of course, to see that a lot of these things are really common and many of them are very involved. So I saw on the internet, a dermatologist was suggesting her evening routine for skin and it had at least 10 different products in it. And when I look at some of these, recipes from the trotula with a number of different ingredients in it. It reminds me of modern skincare and the lengths that we go to to create something that's going to make ourselves look good. I think it also tells us a lot about the state of trade in the Middle Ages and the fact that you could access things like cinnamon and cloves across Europe. So this is something that is not unusual. It's something that you can get hold of and you probably get hold of from the apothecary or from a spice merchant and use them for cosmetics and not just for cooking your food. So it's worth mentioning as I wrap up that everybody in medieval romance and medieval manuscripts is a babe and that is something that is problematic. They don't really take all that much issue with. But perhaps what I should leave you with is our good old friend Gawain who in the poem Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnall is married to a woman who is called a loathly lady. So she is as gross as they could possibly make within the confines of this book. So she's got snot everywhere. She's dirty and grimy and all of these things. And when she marries Gawain, she says, this is a spell that I'm under. It makes me look really ugly. And now that we're married, you get to choose whether I'm going to be beautiful during the day, so for other people, or beautiful during the night for you. And Gawain, my Gawain, says, you choose. At which point, of course, the spell is broken and everyone lives happily ever after. So I'm going to be like my friend Gawain today and say when it comes to beauty, it is always your choice to decide what looks good and how you want to show up to the world and how you want to show up to your partner. It's always a choice that's in your hands. So you can look at all the beauty magazines that are out there. You can look at all the beauty advice from the Middle Ages, but always decide on your own what is beautiful to you. And it's going to be something that, of course is on the inside. If you're interested in supporting Joe Jones's work, please visit beautybanks.org.uk. And for everyone else all over the world, please remember that when you donate to a food bank, you can usually donate those hygiene and beauty products that will help other people feel their best. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on this week, Peter? Hey, hey, so our columnists have been doing a lot of good things lately. Adam Alley is coming out with another piece. This one's on Babak's revolt of the early ninth century. And this is a revolt against the Abbasids. And he's lately been writing about kind of a religious movement from the eighth and ninth century called the Karamea, Kurumuzism. And it's, it's really in depth. So I hope you've been enjoying that. It's something I haven't didn't know very much about. So it's been a little fascinating look at for me. Our Power of the Text series continues with looking at how medieval readers viewed ancient writers you know like hey what did you think of Ovid and it can be even in nightmares <laughs> well I think there's some stuff that will give you nightmares from the metamorphosis for sure <laughs> <laughs> and they often would like write back to an ancient writer you know hey Aristotle how's it going so fun stuff like that. I've been working on a piece on 25 items from daily life in the Middle Ages. And so it's a kind of a really introductory piece, something that if you don't know very much about the Middle Ages, we want to get a really simple start into it. Uh, this tells you little things like things like a comb or a musical instrument. We're kind of pairing up with uh, medieval manuscript images. So it looks nice. Oh, good. I'm glad that's going to be something to look forward to. Indeed, I hope people like it. And hopefully some people may want to use like a school. Well, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> well, good luck with finishing that one. I know you're working hard on it. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to all of Medievalist.net's patrons on patreon.com for all your support. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and the new Medieval World, formerly known as Medieval Warfare Magazine, as well as a book club and exclusive maps by Tina Ross. Patronage funds this podcast as well as Medievalist.net's other work, so thank you. For those of you who are interested in trying out the new Medieval World Magazine and supporting yours truly, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. 
For everything from cosmetics to comets, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a beautiful day. Beautiful.